And we have uh, on next item on the agenda is the matter of the day. And uh, Dr. Kiva Archibald has been given leave to make a statement on the outcome of the EU trade talks, which fulfils the criteria set out in Standing Order 24. If other members wish to be called, they should do so by rising in their places and continuing to do so. All members called will have up to three minutes to speak on the subject. I would remind members that I will not take any points of order on this or any other matter until the item of business has finished. I call Kiva Archibald. Can call you and thanks for accepting um, this matter of the day, which is a very important um, issue for us all. There are only 17 days left until the end of the transition period, and despite ongoing and we are told intensive negotiation, there is yet no outcome in terms of the future arrangements for a free trade deal between Britain and the EU. While last week, after four and a half years since the North and our citizens and businesses had been plunged into Brexit calamity, it was welcome to get some degree of clarity in relation to the implementation of the Irish Protocol. It was very clear that the systems and processes for businesses to trade seamlessly without tariffs were nowhere near ready, and the grace period that has been provided offers a short-term relief. However, we need to see serious work by the British Government over the next six months and real and meaningful engagement with businesses here. While that uh, clarity was welcome, there remains great uncertainty for businesses and individuals that will only be resolved when there is an outcome to the current negotiations. To still be in the situation where in just over a fortnight new trading arrangements of some description are supposed to be in place, but as yet we do not know what they will be, is ludicrous. The operation of the protocol will be more or less difficult depending on the free trade deal that is or is not agreed. Those who campaign for Brexit, including those in parties here, clearly have miscalculated and missold the notion of what leaving the EU would mean, despite all warnings to the contrary. Back in 2016, Michael Gove was saying, we will be in a position, I think, to secure a better deal than the one that we have now. No one is seriously arguing that Britain would be outside that free trade area, that tariff barriers would be erected and that Britain's manufacturing goods would be at a disadvantage. I think he's probably had a rethink on that. The British Government have dragged their feet on negotiation over the past year and instead of engaging genuinely, appear to have tried to wriggle out of commitments made in the withdrawal agreement. Back in September, the British government seriously damaged trust in the process through the publication of the Internal Market Bill, which clauses they have now removed in terms of breaching international law and undermining trust in negotiations. This was a needless attempt at a delaying tactic in the wider negotiation, and what they have achieved by it is not clear, because there is simply no logic. Deals are secured by agreement, not threats. Deadline after deadline has been missed, but the only real deadline is the 31st of December, and it's simply not on that, at this, that the fate of our businesses and communities in the, is in the hands of Tories who appear to be intent on running down the clock and care not one jot about this place or our citizens and businesses other than when it serves their interests as a bargaining chip. And I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mr. Speaker. Sir, I have no intention of uh, repeating the arguments that were aired at the time of the referendum, other than to say that every citizen of the United Kingdom had an equal say and an equal vote in that referendum, whether they were a citizen in John O'Groats or Land's End, Strabane or London. Each citizen of this country had an equal say, and the country as a whole made the decision to leave the European Union, and I believe that it was the right decision to leave the European Union. I welcome some of the clarity that has been provided over recent weeks, and there has clearly been improvement in the situation vis-à-vis -vis Northern Ireland. Nevertheless, I think it is a fundamental right of any country to make their own arrangements for the regulation of their own trade and internal markets, and that any government, least of all a Conservative and Unionist government, should hand away that right, to me, is baffling. I believe that the provisions of the protocol, far from being helpful to Northern Ireland business, far from providing the best of both worlds, will be a hindrance to businesses in Northern Ireland. The Chair of the Economy Committee, or the, the Member for East Londonderry, referred to other parties in this chamber, by which I presume she was referring to my party 
and to two thirds of the Ulster Unionists who supported Leave as well, um, as not acting in the interests of the people. Any person who stands up and says a regulatory border up the inside of the Irish Sea is a good thing for our people. It's for them to justify how that is good for our people. How placing barriers to trade from Northern Ireland businesses is good for our people. It evidently is not. And anyone arguing otherwise is either being disingenuous, and I'm not suggesting for one second, I'm mindful of your ruling, sir, earlier, is either being disingenuous or is being economically illiterate. So it's for them to justify that argument. But I want to be clear, a trade deal will be preferable. Of course it will be preferable. But it must be on favourable terms for the United Kingdom. And if the Prime Minister is not in a position to secure those favourable terms, then sometimes in a negotiation, the answer has to be no. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, pleased to see this matter of the day granted, if a little surprised. Um, uh, as we speak here uh, in the Assembly Chamber, negotiations are uh, continuing. Uh, what we were told was a deadline yesterday has proven um, uh, not to be a deadline. Um, but the UK, uh, including uh, Northern Ireland, is due to leave the EU uh, transition period uh, at the end of this year, trade deal or no trade deal. Uh, I think, Mr. Speaker, for, it's first of all worth saying that it is unconscionable and immoral that Boris Johnson's government chose not to extend the transition period in the middle of the, of a, the biggest pandemic in 100 years. Um, sometimes in the midst of debates over um, the protocol and trade between the UK and EU more generally, uh, we forget how extraordinary an act that was to pers continue pursuing this in the middle of the biggest public health crisis and economic disruption that any of us have experienced in our lifetimes. Nevertheless, we are where we are. The transition period is ending in 17 days. Our businesses here have been criminally let down in terms of having adequate information to prepare for the end of the transition period. Last week's uh, announcements from the Joint Committee on um, mitigations and, and preparations for the protocol were certainly welcome. They don't go uh, all the way to, to making uh, the, those arrangements as seamless as we want, but I'm glad that there is some goodwill at Joint Committee and principles have been agreed in terms of, of making those arrangements work. Let's return to why those arrangements are necessary. They are necessary because successive UK governments have insisted upon a rigid, hard definition of Brexit. They have insisted upon a Victorian concept of sovereignty, and they have insisted at asserting it on the island of Ireland without the consent of people in Northern Ireland. That is, unfortunately, why um, the Ireland Protocol has been necessary, an uncomfortable set of arrangements to manage the complexity of our uh, of, our, um, of our society and of our uh, economy, Mr Speaker, so we welcome that it is being implemented. But now where we are is that the UK um, and the EU are still talking. They should cease talking and agree a deal. Particularly Boris Johnson should finally conclude what he said would be easy, which is a trade deal between the UK and the EU. For years he said that the EU would be begging to give uh, the UK a trade deal. Well, we're nearly we're a little more than a fortnight now from the end of the transition period. Businesses here in Northern Ireland, businesses across these islands, frankly, and their employees want certainty. They should get it. People, particularly in this part of the world, don't need any more uncertainty. We don't need any more disruption. It's frankly unacceptable that we're even having to debate this today, as I said, in the middle of this pandemic. So if there are any of those still waiting, still think that no deal is a good idea, listen to this place, sign that deal, do it now. Thank you. And I call Steve Aiken. Much indeed, and thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Um, the fact that we haven't reached the crisis point yet on the free trade agreement and the fact that the European Union and the United Kingdom government are still speaking, I think should be welcomed by everybody in this House. And for those of us who listened to Michal Martin, the Taoiseach, yesterday on the media, on the Sunday media programmes, when he took a much more emollient line than Simon Coveney took over these discussions, I think again is to be welcomed. I think singling out the United Kingdom government throughout this as being somehow as the sole blame doesn't work. 
This has been something that is between the European Union and the United Kingdom Government that has reached this stage. However, I think everybody in this Assembly should feel with concern that, as we are, as been pointed out by the Chair of the Economies uh, Committee, that we are 17 days before a lot of these rules and regulations come into place. And indeed, if anybody like myself had the misfortune to read through the Northern Ireland Office's command paper that was published on Friday, look trying to seek some details of what was going to happen to Northern Ireland businesses, we would be very sorely disappointed. And again, I am particularly concerned that today the Joint Committee was supposed to sit, and I understand that the Joint Committee is not sitting today. So again, we are not looking at 17 days before there is a degree of clarity on these rules and regulations. We are potentially looking at a much shorter period of time. Now is not the time to be keeping information away from Northern Ireland businesses. Now is not the time for people who need to know what they need to be putting in place starting on the 1st of January to do that as well. I would encourage and I would ask every member of this Assembly to encourage both uh, Michel Barnier, uh, Lord Frost and indeed the British and the European Government to make sure there is some form of free trade agreement. And as if they say we are down to some very small areas of concern that need to be worked out, they need to be worked out rapidly. Because no matter what happens, here in the Northern Ireland Assembly, the Northern Ireland Protocol comes into place on 1 January. That will have significant implications on everything we do. And the fact that we as an Assembly will not have any say over close on 136 areas of competency that will slowly but surely flow its way into what we are trying to do should be a concern for all of us who believe in devolution and democracy. And indeed, that is going to be the approach that the Ulster Unionist Party will be taking from now on. We will closely examine every single piece of legislation that is likely to be imposed upon us and ask this very clear question. Does it undermine the principles of the Belfast Agreement? And if it is good for Northern Ireland or not? And those are the questions we will be asking ourselves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And just before I start, I'm sure I will wish to say to you that I will reflect on your advice. Thank you for it today. Um, Mr Speaker, um, recriminations on how we've got to where we are today in respect of the protocol and indeed Brexit in general probably are not really the matter of the day. Whether you are a party who dragged us out of the United, K uh, the United Kingdom, out of the EU, or you were a party who perhaps didn't do enough to keep us in the EU. Um, but I think it's important that we recognise that uh, the Prime Minister clearly is either working to or against that very famous book by another world failure, The Art of the Deal. Uh, clearly, he's not going to be able to achieve a deal because he is, as our Prime Minister uh, clearly is, uh, trapped in the arms of his rabid Brexiteers. They are the people who he's looking over the shoulder to uh, to ensure uh, that the UK gets a no deal Brexit. None of that can be in the interests of the citizens of Northern Ireland, and they are the people who matter in this chamber and in this discussion today. The protocol and members have made reference to it, is not the ideal mechanism uh, to deliver for Northern Ireland. The only real deal for Northern Ireland would have been to remain within the European Union. But the Prime Minister does need to do a deal, and he does need to compromise. Uh, he does need to recognise, uh, as Mr Toole and others will, will undoubtedly say in this chamber, that looking back on the jingoistic days of gunboat diplomacy are over for the United Kingdom. We, are, we live in a modern, sophisticated, integrated society, one that we all depend on each other in, and that includes at the single European market. To deny us and to deny the United Kingdom access to that market is nothing short of a disgrace, and I support the matter of the day. And I call Jim Allister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, given that um, the outcome of these matters will affect each and every citizen, each and every constituent of ours, would it really be too much to hope that everyone would be hoping for, looking for, and supporting a good outcome for the United Kingdom? 
And instead, alas, I detect that there are some hoping and looking for a good outcome for the EU, who are prioritising the advantages of the EU over our own country. And I think at this critical time, that is quite shameful. There are others, we've just heard one of them, uh, who can't get over himself in terms of the outcome of the referendum and still wants to fight a lost battle. We really are at the point where the United Kingdom's future, the deal it gets, affects us all. And therefore, therefore we should have all common cause in seeking for the best outcome for the United Kingdom. Whether you are pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit, the challenge of the moment is getting the best deal for the United Kingdom. And I am saddened that for some, this matter of the day is just another device to have a go at the British government uh, and all that goes with it. Uh, and of course, we have to remember that whether it's a good deal, a bad deal, or no deal, we in Northern Ireland, sadly, are still left with the iniquitous protocol uh, and still have to live with the uh, dreadful economic and constitutional circumstances which it creates. Uh, and that is why, in this House, I will use every opportunity to oppose the iniquity of that protocol and will not be rolling over to imposing upon us and enslaving us in EU rules and regulations. Uh, and I think anyone who cares anything for the integrity of the United Kingdom should do likewise. Thank you. And I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, some, in Northern, some Northern Ireland politicians advocated Brexit, who believed against all the evidence that Brexit would be positive. Surely no one, no one still believes that. But then again, perhaps some do, as we heard from Mr. Stulford uh, and Mr. Uh, Alistair. I don't say this uh, politely in a way to spare people's feelings in the DUP and the TUV, and indeed people before profit. But if they still believe that, then they clearly are deluded. Brexit has always been a great delusion. For four years, businesses across Northern Ireland have been deprived of investment that would have come if investors had known what shape uh, of trade after Brexit would be. Just over two weeks from the end of the transition arrangement, those investors still do not know what shape of an outcome we are going to have. You couldn't make it up. At least we do know that Northern Ireland will have an open border north and south, but trade barriers from the east. But consumers will pay a price for this, including higher food costs. Not exactly what the Brexit campaigners claimed would happen. Nor was it mentioned that British nationals with property in France or Portugal or wherever might only be able to visit their homes for three months and every six months. Admit this, there is one thing that we have to be grateful for, and I would say right across this House, that Northern Ireland does have a protocol. Without that protocol, all the problems that are in the Irish sea border, and there's plenty of them, would be happening here instead, right here on the island of Ireland, but much worse. So let us at least be thankful for that and be thankful for the protocol. The problem is not the protocol. The problem is Brexit. Even more, the problem is the architects of Brexit. They did not have a clear idea of the shape of the Brexit they wanted or how the objectives that they wanted most would be made from Brexit and would be achieved, uh, achieved through the negotiations. That is why the negotiations thus far have failed. I wonder if the First Minister could turn back time, as Cher has said, could reflect on how she regrets her phone call that day to Theresa May, blocking a deal that would have been much better for Northern Ireland and would have been much better for every single citizen in Northern Ireland. Had it not been that for that phone call, Northern Ireland would have retained a closer relationship with, uh, with Britain, with clarity from, from a long time ago of how Brexit would work in practice. 
uh, here on this island. Instead, those who made the political decisions went into denial, pretending that when it came to economic Brexit, uh, outcome, sorry, economic outcomes, Brexit didn't really mean Brexit. As it is, it's a disaster for all of us. So Brexit was always a great delusion. And the result of that delusion is that the North has lost investment, and that means it has lost jobs that would come here and the wealth that would have come here with it. We have now less than two the weeks, just up. a little bit more than two weeks left. Let's forget about the delusion. Let's get a deal done. Let's support every single citizen in Northern Ireland. And the Member's UK up. must give up its delusional uh, dreams of, of, of a Brexit. Member's time is up. Thank you. Okay. And I call Royal Beggs. As others have indicated, there's only 17 days left until the end of the transition period. And while some are saying there is increased certainty uh, and, and trading arrangements going forward as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol, I would differ. I think if you examine the document, firstly it says that there is agreement in principle, so it is not finalised. And that must be of concern to everyone. Some of the aspects of it may it be a slight improvement on what we may have otherwise faced from the earlier versions, but nevertheless, even uh, what is contained within it should give concern to everyone. In particular, uh, our supermarkets, our supplies uh, to our shelves, they have got a three months extension, and thereafter they have to work out how they are going to get their stock to their shelves. Some items may not be stocked in the future. That is not something that I wish to welcome. Uh, I think it's healthy that there's uh, uh, an adequate choice and that there should be freedom of movement of products within any country. But this border down the RIC that has been uh, agreed at a high level against the Belfast Agreement, which was meant to protect uh, all sides, there has been no agreement from the unionist community to a border down the RIC. That requirement has been totally no ignored in all the process to date, uh, and therefore I, I cannot, not, cannot welcome it. There was meant to be promised uh, unfettered access east-west, and with that, west-east. That is not the case. As I have indicated, there will be restrictions, particularly on food, animal products, even in terms of uh, the farming community. I understand there are uh, UI lambs trapped in Scotland. They can't move until the 1st of January, but they can't move after the 1st of January. They can't move. They're, they're caught in some sort of limbo land. Uh, future breeding stock, uh, where farmers would bring in uh, frequently bulls from uh, um, uh, um, sterling sales or uh, Carlisle sales. How is that going to happen? There will be additional costs and quarantining and regulations if it is possible to bring that stock in at all. Uh, also in terms of other animals. There will be difficulty with, with uh, people going on holidays with their pets. Presumably new uh, vaccines, uh, pet passports, bureaucracy will be required, and therefore I cannot welcome, welcome that. It is, it is not appropriate that there should be restrictions on movement within any country, and, and that is not something that I wish to uh, welcome. Uh, in fact, I, I find it disregarding, as I have indicated, on what was agreed in the Belfast agreement. The change, the status of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom is changing as a result of these, these announcements. Up. And then for that reason, I cannot support it. And I wish that others would reflect that change that has occurred uh, uh, as well. Thank you. And that concludes the matter of the day. Point of order, Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I just was briefly hoping you could advise on um, on the matter of the day process. Last week I submitted two different matters of the day on precisely this subject. They weren't granted, but this one was.